Hey guys, welcome to Boxing Squared for boxing news and views from around the internet. And another heavyweight news mashup video today, starting with Deontay Wilder and his trainer Malik Scott, who says that Deontay Wilder is better than ever. He's been in a violent camp and will knock Tyson Fury out in five rounds. So their third fight is scheduled for 9th October. And Malik Scott talking to Sky Sports. So he says, Fury fights with his hands down, at times with his chin up, at times he comes forward, at times he is close with his hands down. He's been knocked down by guys guys who hit hard, less hard than Deontay. He is very vulnerable. I've never seen Fury fight and say, wow. He's unbeatable. On his day, he looks good, but he's still beatable. This Deontay would knock out the old Deontay in two rounds. He's 10 times more focused, training 100 times harder. It's a violent camp. His mentality is very violent. This will be the best version of Deontay Wilder that you have ever seen. And then further down in the story, he continues, Deontay's IQ is very high. I watch him create watch him put himself in position, set guys up into surgical traps. Deontay will knock Fury out inside of five rounds. Well, it's all there for Deontay Wilder to do after being embarrassed so badly in the rematch. If he does turn it around, it would be a one of the biggest sort of comebacks, I think, in terms of uh, performance to performance in boxing history. But he's got power. It's not impossible, that's for sure. And if Malik Scott says he's improving, well, I guess we'll have to see on fight night. But uh, Wilder never out of a fight with his power, but Fury is the favorite for a reason off the back of that second fight. What do you make of those comments by Malik Scott? It's hard to know how much of that is really he believes that, how much is that uh, is hype, and how much is that to sell the fight? Maybe a bit of um, all three. Anyway, moving on. So uh, Daniel Dubois has arrived in the United States. He is on this uh, Jake Paul undercard this week facing Joe Kusumanu. So as we know, Daniel Dubois is coming off a loss in 2020 to Joe Joyce. He's in a rebuild mode. He's had one fight since then that was against Bogdan Dinu. Uh, inextricably, a WBA trinket was on the line. So he is the WBA interim uh, heavyweight champion although not defending that title by the looks of it in this fight. Kusumanu is not ranked, but an opportunity to fight in America for the first time for Daniel Dubois. He should make short work of uh, Joe Kusumanu in this fight. Um, Kusumanu, he's an okay heavyweight, but he's not exactly on the tip of most people's tongues as an opponent that's really going anywhere or doing anything of note in the heavyweight division. And for some boxing fans, he's a more obscure American heavyweight compared to a lot of others that have a much higher profile and have been doing things of note in the ring. So Daniel Dubois will get the um, the win here. And it's one of these sort of situations. Sometimes you get these, I mean, I'm not going to call it a marginal fight, but it's let's not mince words. It kind of is that, but I understand why he's in this level of fight for his rebuild. It comes one of these situations, if I've done a video when the fight was announced, in fight week, it's always that, do I do a second standalone video and basically say most of the same things? And I did not want to do that for this one. Um, so hence, I'm folding it into this video. Looking forward to seeing Daniel Dubois return, but it's hard to get hyped about this sort of fight. The only real interest is it's on this pay-per-view card that's headlined by Jake Paul, who's actually uh, saying, and I had to, um, to throw this in here, he says, I'm on a trajectory to become the biggest prize fighter in the world for the kids i look like mike tyson your grandpa had muhammad ali and mike tyson your dad had floyd mayweather this generation has jake paul okay i'm uh, not going to touch that with a 10 foot barge pole and moving on so junior far has posted that uh, negotiations for a fight with uh, justice Huni, the australian heavyweight champion who's currently recovering from hand surgery has uh, reached a stumbling blo uh, block in negotiations and actually we'll get to the sporting news story that is sort of um you know referred to in this post from instagram 
So Farr's um, representative, so remembering he's promoted by Lou DiBella, and DiBella is represented uh, in Australia by Brendan Burke. He tells the Sporting News that the stumbling block in making the fight is at Dean Lonigan's feet. So Lonigan promotes Justice Hooney. So Burke says, Lonigan has been talking a lot of hot air, but we still don't have a contract and things have stalled. There are about five or six sticking points that neither team are willing to move on. Location is one of them, percentage splits, things like that and then he goes on to talk about uh, things related to uh, Australia the situation with COVID and where different sporting events are taking place etc but he does say uh, there are levels to this game we know Justice is a fine young fighter lots of potential but Junior Far is seasoned he's had about 20 pro bouts and the only loss he's had is at world championship level against Joseph Parker well I would note it wasn't at world championship level because Joseph Parker nor Junior Far were world champions at the time that they fought uh, so so he continues, Lonigan had a great young fighter, but I don't know why they're rushing him so fast. Junior will give him more than he can handle. I can't see Hooney winning the fight, and I think they're realizing that, and they're getting cold feet. Okay, so there's a few things to go through here, because I actually think this is a pretty tough fight for Justice Hooney at this uh, stage of his development, especially coming off uh, the surgery, and you would have thought perhaps he would be wanting uh, a fight that was uh, of a slightly sort of lower level. Junior Farr did prove against Joseph Parker that he is a fighter of some note, that he's got skills, he can hang with good fighters. Ultimately, he didn't get a decision in that uh, fight against Parker. Some people thought that um, he did win that fight. So it was relatively close and he was able to do a number of things, land a number of good counters, nullify Joseph Parker to a large extent. Although we have been seeing Parker hasn't necessarily been mailing in you know, great performances in recent years. Uh, sort of after 2018, a number of tune-ups and uh, he's only had a couple of fights of note in the past few years. One of those being against Derek Chisora, where he also didn't really sort of perform either and that was the same for this far fight it's sort of people are expecting more of Parker but he's not delivering but far did perform well in that fight and perform better than many expected so I think this is a quite a tough fight but on the other side of the coin here where they talk about there's five or six uh, sticking points to the contract and you know yada 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 Justice Hooney and his team they are in my view the ones that are in the the driving seat because Justice Hooney is clearly the A side. He's clearly the one that's bringing the the name value and most of the money, you know, for this sort of fight. Junior Farr is a decent opponent, but he doesn't have a, a massive fan base necessarily, and he's coming off a loss too. So there's a couple of things like that that you know I don't think they necessarily have the um, the negotiating power that they probably believe they have. Although they were able to force some concessions from Joseph Parker and his camp, but it seemed pretty um, at the time that Parker and his team were wedded to the idea of the far fight. So they had to give ground because it was the only option in front of. Of Joseph Parker at that point whereas for Justice Sunni he can probably go other directions but actually just on some stuff that Junior Far had been posting to social media and this came out from a story from um, in New Zealand uh, a quote from it from the News Hub article I really want to fight I really I don't want to waste these years of my prime sitting at home if I have to move abroad to get fights then I will and in the comment on the right hand side, COVID got me playing chess outside of the ring too. Uh, hashtag next move. Well, I'm not really sure that it's um, sort of some sort of revelation that you can't forge a lucrative and successful career in New Zealand. The pool of um, heavyweights is just so small, and you've already fought the one guy that would give you any, you know, decent money. So, I mean, I don't think this is something that boxing fans will be surprised about, that you can't, you know, basically uh, live and fight in New Zealand and expect to get paid and uh, a handsome earning. I mean, and I would also extend that to Australia. Outside of a Justice Hooney fight, what is there really for Junior Farr? You know, facing a wash Lucas Brown, and there's not much else. So the reality is, if he is going to forge a career for the next four, five, six years, and he wants to get well paid and fight regularly, he's going to have to go offshore. So I don't see that as being any sort of, you know, wow, you know, I've had a revelation type moment. It just is what it is. UK, US, or potentially even fights within Europe. But it's, um, you know, UK, US, if you're going to fight anyone of note for any real sort of money, 
outside of the couple of guys that you've already either fought in Parker or potentially could fight in Huni. That just is the, if you want to keep being a pro boxer and get paid, you've got to go elsewhere. Um, anyway, what do you make of it all? Drop a comment loud and often. Hit like, hit subscribe, follow me on Twitter, boxing underscore squared. I'm out.